Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. My guests today are Val Sender and Jeng Chu of Delaware Life. So welcome to the podcast, Val and Jeng. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great to have you back. Val, nice to have you for the first time. Before we get started, for the benefit of our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a brief overview? Val, let's start with you. Sure. So Val Sender, I've been uh, around the financial services area for about 20 plus years and worked along the side of mutual fund industry and insurance slash annuity industries. Uh, And now I specialize for Delaware Life uh, with the retirement planning, income planning, and part of my expertise, if you will, is the aspect of social security. Great. Jack? Hi, my name is Jeng Chu. I have been in the street for about 24 years. My background is in accounting and law. I've done many different roles, including a lot of fee-based financial planning. Now I am with Delaware Life's national consulting team, talking about different retirement topics, including Social Security. Great. Well, our topic today is Social Security. And Bell, in your experience working with advisors, you encounter a lot of common questions Perhaps you could walk us through some of the questions that you receive from advisors and what they need to know about those answers. Sure. One of the very first questions I get is, you know, where is the first time I can claim Social Security? When do I become eligible for Social Security? And also whether Social Security correlates to a retirement, right? Because some people think they're retiring, therefore they need to claim Social Security. Sometimes these two questions not really, not necessarily dependent on one another. I can retire from work. Doesn't mean that I have to claim Social Security and the other way around. However, to answer that first question, when can I first claim it, is, is the age 62. So as opposed to Medicare, where the age has not changed and is still at 65, and that's what it was initially for Social Security, it's gotten changed to 62 as a first age of eligibility. And I believe under the stats, it's I believe it's the second most common or most popular claiming age, just because it becomes available. Somebody was waiting for it. It's there for me. I can just go ahead and take it. It is reduced when it's claimed earlier versus uh, full retirement age. So that's something to keep in mind. And also, it's not really just an individual decision, because if there is a husband and wife, that reduced benefit is for life. So it's not a decision whether, you know, how long am I going to live? What, but whether the decision, you know, am I married or have I been married? And what is that situation going to be like for, let's say, for my spouse or my surviving spouse? Yeah. You mentioned that the benefit is reduced. How important is that in factoring in whether to take it early or not? Well, it's substantial. It could mean substantial amount of money left on the table. But I think, you know, in my conversations with advisors and some clients, it's really a personal decision because if there are means to sustain a lifestyle, whichever the aspirations are, financial situation, health care for family, you know, this could be an option. But if somebody's full retirement age, which majority of us still are at 66, that benefit is reduced by 25%. And for those of us who full retirement age is at 67, which is everybody born 1960 and and later, that benefit is reduced by 30%. So it's a substantial reduction and that reduction is really permanent. Right. And I suppose one of the downstream effects of taking it early is the effect that it has on the survivor's benefit, assuming that the survivor's benefit is lower than what the primary wage earners was. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. What's another question that you get revolving around spouses or ex-spouses? So another common question is, you know, we live in a society where, you know, for good, for worse, divorces do happen and spouses oftentimes don't know whether they can claim a benefit of uh, of an ex-spouse. And actually it does happen that a spouse can claim of a former uh, spouse benefit and it has nothing to do with the other, let's say, first spouse's benefit. The ex-spouse becomes eligible for the benefit if they were married for at least 10 years, and they can claim that benefit without having an effect on the other person's or the first spouse's own benefit. It's a pretty unknown fact that it's actually doable. And if somebody has been married a couple of times, and let's say uh, two times, 10 years to each, they can 
They can actually pick and choose which of those spouses is a higher benefit and they can claim off that higher earning spouse. Right. A lot of time, ex-spouses aren't aware that they can claim on their former spouse's social security. Are the things that they need in order to file as a for a spousal benefit from an ex-spouse? They just need the marriage and a divorce decree to show to social security. And that's usually probably already in the administration's records. So they can just show that and they should be able to go ahead and claim the benefit. Right. And I guess another question revolving around spousal benefits, especially with ex-spouses, is the opportunity to either to collect the spousal benefit or a benefit based on your own work record. Any thoughts about that? So it would really be depending on whose benefit would be higher. There is an opportunity for a spouse to claim their own benefit if that happens to be higher. They don't have to claim it off of the divorce spouse's benefit. So that depends whose benefit is higher. And a social security will do the deemed filing and whichever benefit is that spouse eligible for, they'll be eligible for the higher of the two. Mm. And then we talked about claiming early. You get questions sometimes about delaying social security as well. Uh, Yes. So, you know, that depends again on the financial situation, family situation, health situation, whether there there are any assets to sustain, let's say from the retirement time, let's say it's age 60 or age 62, somebody wants to just stop working. And what options do they have about claiming social security? They want to delay it until age 67 or even age 70, right? The maximum age that we can really postpone claiming social security. And everything above that age will accrue had guaranteed, right now it is guaranteed at least at 8% per year. So if somebody were to claim it at age, uh, let's say, 62, they will have the benefit substantially reduced versus claiming it at age 70. So if there are two spouses in a family, my default position always always has been, for right or wrong, but it always has been that the, uh, the higher earning spouse should probably delay longer versus the lower earning spouse. Maybe the lower earning, sp- earning spouse can claim it earlier, but then the higher earning spouse could delay as, as long as possible to benefit from those delayed retirement credits at 8%. It's guaranteed, it's inflation adjusted, it's not market exposed, right? So there are, there are various benefits from that. So there are some benefits to that. Mm. Jeng, you've been silent. Any thoughts about this notion of delaying claiming Social Security past FRA? Yeah, I think one of the things that people have to understand or people should consider is that Social Security is not correlated to the market. And obviously, I mean, that's a pretty obvious statement. But when you think of the volatility of the marketplace and stocks and inflation and all these other considerations, for many people, if they could hold off on collecting Social Security, it just might make sense because you're guaranteed a very high return. And also, you want to build up your non-correlated assets because if the market really falls, you're going to have to rely on those non-correlated assets and you don't want to tap into your retirement accounts. So the later you can, so if you have enough assets and the market's doing fine, you might want to go ahead and delay because that will build up a reserve essentially so that if the market falls 30%, You don't have to tap into your other investable assets. You could start collecting your social security and that will suffice. And that way it will allow your assets to grow back and come back when the market rebounds. So something to consider a lot of times people will think of social security by itself rather than part of an income playing strategy. Val, another question that you sometimes get is about whether you can change your mind about claiming once you've claimed social security, whether you can change your mind. Yes, that's, you know, that could come up, right? Because somebody wants to claim it earlier, but then maybe they go back to work six months down the line or something happens, maybe they they receive a windfall and they don't want to have that benefit anymore because they might want to delay it later from in that situation. So if as long as it's within the first 12 months of of filing for the claim, the beneficiary can uh, can return everything to uh, to Social Security, right? So that, that's one of those mulligans type things. I can return everything I've received and everybody and anybody that received the benefit on my record would also have to return it to Social Security. And it looks like it looks like the benefit was never claimed. So it's uh, wiped the uh, uh, slate clean and uh, and it's and it's done, right? So it's like I never. I've never done it before. So that's one of the situations. And then another situation could be we're at the full, the actual full retirement age. So if I claimed earlier, but come full retirement age, I want to postpone my, my benefit. I can get in touch with the administration, put it on hold. I don't have to pay anything back. Uh, it will Those 8% delay retirement credits will accrue or, or at lower on a lower base. 
but it's also uh, the option. The mm -hmm. first first option can only be done with the, within the first 12 months, and it can only be available once. Right. And the other one where you suspend can only be done after full retirement age. It, yes, correct. Right. Jang, any thoughts to add about uh, whether people might consider using this tactic? Yeah, I think, you know, in the past, there were some other strategies like, you know, the traditional file and suspend, the payback strategies, and now it's more limited. But I think it's important to understand that there is some flexibility within the year that you have. So it allows you to assess things like, as Val mentioned, your financial health, but also, you know, what are any, did anything change in terms of your, of your lifestyle? Is anything happening? Uh, you know, is your health situation any different? So it gives you a year, sort of a grace period to assess your financial situation. And Social Security at least allows you to do that. So I think it's a great tool. A lot of people don't realize that once they start collecting, they within the first year, they could stop. Of course, you only do it once. But it does give you an opportunity that if you if something does happen, then you should actually be aware of it because it can make a big difference. Yeah, definitely. I call Social Security as making the right choice, not necessarily knowing the right choice or maybe knowing and making could mean the same thing, but really making the right choice because usually when it's made, it's final because you know a small percent of folks will know that they'll pay it back and they want to uh, restart it later on. So it's really, really critical to understand the entire situation, the time horizon, life expectancy, and, and health uh, to do that. However, there is that option available. If, if I don't need it, I can give it back and then do it again later on. Right. So another common question that you get, Val, has to do with one of my favorite topics, which is the break-even analysis. Talk about that. Yes. So there are some difference of opinions on this in, in the marketplace about Social Security, you know, whether I want to claim early or claim later, what is that break even age, what is that break even point point, you know, to me, it's more of a, of a, of a purchase of a longevity insurance. And in my mind, I don't make a dec insurance dec decisions based on yeah, longevity in this case, you know, if I claim early at 62, uh, and I live, let's say, to you know, 95, 100 years old, I'm just going to receive a smaller dollar amount, but for a longer period of time. If I claim it at full retirement age, 66, 67, or even at 70, and I still live to 95 or 100, I'm going to receive a higher dollar amount per month. Uh, but all in all, it makes no difference to the administration whether somebody claims it late or, or early because it's all done on just the actual calculation. Uh, so to me, it's more of a of a safety net decision uh, than a break-even uh, decision. That's again, given that there are other resources to sustain that person to to let's say postpone if they want to postpone claiming of uh, uh, of the social security benefit. Hmm. I would agree with Val on that too, because a lot of times, you know, people will say the traditional thought was maybe 12 years after full retirement age, right? So if it's 67, 79. But if you think about it, if you're doing a calculation based on what could happen 12 years from now, there's so many different variables, right? In terms of if you were to take the lower amount and if you were to invest it, does that alter the, um, the calculus? Uh, what happens if something happens to the Social Security Administration? We, might, we don't think it will, but there could be changes. There could be reduced benefits. There could be uh, you know, whatever it might be, there could be a higher full retirement age. So to do a calculus based on what might happen 12 years from now, uh, you know, there's so many different variables. So I would say there's many factors in deciding when to take Social Security, but I would not say the break-even point would be a clear cut and dry. Here's, you know, my, my family has a history of living to 100, so I'm going to do this. Obviously, it's one of many factors and so it's, it's a probability analysis. So take it for what it's worth with a grain of salt, because there's so many different variables that could alter your calculation in determining whether that's the right decision. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The Social Security Administration used to have on its website a break-even calculator, which they have since taken down. And the reason that they took it down, I'm told, is that they thought far too many people didn't understand what it was and were claiming early, thinking that they would never live past um, the break-even point. I think it's one of the uh, the common issues with folks. Folks just underestimate their 
their life expectancy and longevity. You know, we, we say 70 and then we live until 90 and then and then you got to live with the consequences that we had no about no idea about 20 years prior. Yeah, exactly. When I was 12 years old, I thought people who were 40 were old, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> Never trust anyone over uh, 70 at this point for me, I think. That's right. Uh, now, uh, another question revolves around uh, a wife collecting her benefits at 62 and, and then what happens when um, her spouse claims at FRA. What, what to make of that? Yeah, so that's, that's another question that actually I, I hear uh, quite a bit about is uh, – is uh, let's see. So the spouse wants to claim it at 62, and then let's say you know for the simplicity of conversation, you know, husband and wife. So wife, wife does it earlier, and then the husband says, "Well, once I am of my full retirement age, my benefit is going to be much higher than what she's claiming. Can she step in into my benefit?" And and the answer really is not necessarily. It could depend because because uh, it will be depended upon the difference between the two benefits at full retirement age for each. So if the husband's is a higher uh, benefit at full retirement age versus what the wife would have been. Uh, so yes, the wife would be eligible for an adjustment. That adjustment would be still reduced for age because she is still claiming early before her full retirement age. But it could be a possibility there will be an adjustment to combine the two benefits and make it higher than initially what the, the wife would be would have been receiving. But it's not it's not the the, the custom fifty percent eligibility of the house of the husband's benefit. Mm. That's actually that comes up quite a bit, and I think that's another one of those you know questions or misconceptions or maybe misunderstandings. Yeah. So before we move on to the common myths, there are some questions that come into my inbox, one of which has to do with retirement earnings test and working uh, and collecting before FRA. Uh, a lot of confusion around that. Yeah. So so that what happens is the folks, you know, when I claim again, it's at 62, but they want to continue working. And if they meet uh, a certain threshold in income, uh, the benefits could be could be reduced. Uh, could be subject to taxation. So there are a couple of different things to consider when it comes to this. So that's why many retirees, when they do work, they don't want to earn uh, over a specified dollar amount per year, whether it's uh, speed single or filing jointly. So there are some thresholds and I have it over here uh, working. So for example, if the earnings, so this is before the full retirement age, if the earnings for 2022, if the earnings are, 19,560, so it's not a huge dollar amount. The benefit was, was reduced for every $1 uh, uh, of benefit is reduced uh, if $2 over the threshold are earned. So $1 of reduction in a benefit. So that's something to keep in mind when it comes to you know, working and, 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 and claiming early. I, I, I can claim early, I, reduce smaller, I receive a smaller benefit. Then if I work, that some of the benefit will be withheld. And then I might get taxed on it. So maybe it's not a, such a great deal after all. So again, a full analysis of what's, go, what's going on in a situation probably will be a best choice to really understand the situation and then make a decision based on that. Yeah. Um, and, and one other question before we move on to myths is, uh, do you ever get any questions around survivor's benefits? What, what troubles advisors with respect to their clients around that? So, so that's usually for spouses, right? So the spouse is eligible for the benefit. Uh, so, so the spouse could step into, I call it stepping into, you know, the other person, the, the deceased spouse's shoes, right? If that benefit was higher, the surviving spouse will automatically step in into that higher benefit. So that's why making that decision, whether it's 62 or 66, 67, uh, is really critical because it does affect that surviving spouse and the benefit they are going to receive. Uh, one of the misconceptions about it is there's a, some folks think that if the spouse was, was, was receiving X and then the, the other spouse passed away, they are going to be able to collect both benefits. It's, it's really not. It's one or the other and whichever one is the higher of the two, that's what the surviving spouse will receive. And that also includes the, those delayed retirement credits uh, that, that the deceased spouse uh, had earned, which does not include, for example, in a, in a divorce situation. Mm. Jen, anything to add there on survivor's benefits? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one where you really have to take a holistic approach, right, in terms of uh, analyzing your assets and whether 
taking Social Security at a certain age will affect the other spouse. That is one thing that a lot of times people will make that decision, not only for themselves, but as a collective family. And I think that's very important because Social Security is not um, individual always. It's not individual based. And I also, also mention one other thing about what we talked about a minute ago about folks in the, in the taxation or reduction of Social Security are still working. You know, a lot of times where you get in the situation is that if they – are working at 62, 63, 64, they typically won't take Social Security many times while they're still working because they have enough income coming in where they don't need the additional income uh, many times. But you, where you often see a situation is, let's say they retired, uh, they, they're not working, they collect at 62, 63, wherever it might be, and then they might get a job later in life, right? So then they all of a sudden they get a consulting job. And this actually happened to my father-in-law. He was retired from the nuclear power industry, then he got a contract job doing some consulting work. And then all of a sudden he was facing a situation where he had some reduced income because of he was he has started taking it. So something to consider all these different factors. And I think the most important thing is that you really want to sit down and analyze it holistically in terms of what you should be doing and kind of understand what the decision tree variables that might be out there, because it will impact quite a bit. And sometimes things could change and sometimes things won't change. Uh, and so there are very strict rules, sometimes it's flexible, sometimes it's strict. So there's a lot of variables that you have to kind of really sit down and, and talk to your clients to see what's in the best situation. Yeah. So I keep saying I'm going to move on to common myths, Val, but I've got one more question that comes sure. in my inbox. And, and that has to do with the taxation of Social Security. You mentioned it a second ago. And uh, talk for a moment about that. So that's also depending on the income and its income, you know, either it's filed jointly or a uh, or single income filer. Um, uh, if, if, uh, if a person earns uh, over 32, more or less 32,000 single filer, the benefit is not taxable, but anything above that income and between 32 and 44, thousand uh, dollars it's 50 percent of that benefit will be taxable and then up to 85 percent of the benefit could be taxable beyond that uh, so one good thing about it is that 15 percent 15 one five one 15 percent of the benefit is never taxed but but other than that it's a it's a pretty substantial consideration here because you know when it comes to to working and earning that's really just wages uh, 1099 wages or W-2 ages that counts against uh, the, those withholding of, of Social Security benefit, which, by the way, is later adjusted at the full retirement age, right? So some people don't understand that they think it's, withhold, it's withheld and gone forever, but it's really readjusted at the full retirement age, whereas taxation uh, is not. And, you know, when it comes to taxes, any sort of income, with the exception of maybe I don't know, uh, uh, life insurance uh, uh, loan or life insurance policy or Roth IRA, Every, any type of income would be counted as income uh, for Social Security taxation. So that's that's really a substantial consideration. Again, I like what Jenk says about uh, this holistic approach and holistic planning. I think that's another conversation with, you know, somebody that really knows how to go about it to schedule, you know, claiming, working, and then how to deal with taxes to minimize taxes in retirement. Yeah. Jay, anything that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things people may or may not be aware of. So, for example, muni bond interest may not be federally taxable, but it can actually make your Social Security taxable. So that actually counts into the equation. So that's something that a lot of people are, are unaware of. Um, so there's just a lot of little things here and there that you just want to make sure you do your research when talking to your clients. You know, there's, there's always difference sometimes between making, you know, having the equation be part of the social security calculation for taxes versus being liable for tax for federal income taxes, like for example, muni bonds. So yeah, something yeah. to do something to consider just like, you know, in the past, some muni bonds may not have been alternative minimum tax friendly. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that even muni bonds might throw a little wrench into the calculation as to how social securities are taxed. Yeah. I think the, uh, the term of art is uh, combined income, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Val, I promised we would get to common myths. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's number one on your list? Um, you know, that actually touches on Medicare, uh, Medicare slash social security. So I was actually in a situation with, with folks I was speaking with, they want to retire early. And, uh, and as it was actually closer to a Medicare question than a social security question. But it was, oh, well, I can claim social security at 62, and I'm going to claim Medicare at 62. And, and it's not the case. So Medicare is the first time ever that somebody can claim is, is 65. 
uh, versus Social Security, where that can be claimed anywhere between 62 and 70. So I don't know how many different dates can we tie into that, but but I can claim Social Security really at any time between age 62 and 70. It could be 62 and three months, could be 63 and seven months, it could be 64, etc. So those two really don't go together. But some people really assume that because so, uh, Medicaid is at 65, therefore Social Security is also at 65, and it's that's not the case. No. Jang, any thoughts on that too? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of people sort of think of Social Security and Medicare um, yes as together, but there are some different variables that you. I always talk about variables, but it's true because um, you know when you want to take Social Security, when you want to take Medicare, and sometimes Social Security will actually impact Medicare. So, for example, uh, there's the whole harmless rule that maybe Val could touch upon a little bit. Where if you have a sudden increase in your Medicare premiums, but if you happen to be taking Social Security, that might limit some of the Medicare premiums you have versus if you wait it, you might not be able to you know, have that hold harmless rule. So those are sort of the little nuances that a lot of people should be aware of. Even though they're independent, they are, there are some intertwining between the two and how they interact because they're obviously both uh, important government benefits that many Americans rely on. Mm. Correct. The hold harmless rule is 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 out there. However, it's it's predominantly impacting those that are that the social security benefit is relatively small, because if the Medicare increase uh, is is larger than the actual monthly Medicare increase by, by monthly benefit increase is is larger than social security benefit, then that whole harmless rule holds true. But however, if the Social security benefit is much larger than the increase in Medicare. Yeah, you know that doesn't really affect that per, that, that person. So, uh, so that's something to keep in mind too. How those two uh, go or don't go together. Mm. So I think that brings us to myth number two, having to do with cola adjustments. Myth number two. So I think for 2022, our cola adjustment was 5.9 percent, and I think I've been reading already that uh, that 2023 may be even higher than that. Um, and some folks think that it's an automatic adjustment, and it has been put into law since since mid seventies, I believe seventy five. It's on the CP uh, consumer price index uh, for workers, the CPIW. And if there is if there is inflation, then we do get cola adjustments to the benefit, but it doesn't happen automatically. If there isn't any, there are a couple of years recently there was no adjustment at all. Uh, we had 5.9 last year. We had 1. Point, uh, actually, this year we had 1.8 for uh, for 2021. But it, but it's not automatic. But it is built in into the law that if there is increase in CPI, then there is an automatic. There is an adjustment into the uh, into the benefit. Jen? Yeah, I think it's important to always kind of keep track. And I think the the government tries to make uh, because Social Security is is the income for many Americans. It's the primary source of income. So I think the government makes an effort to try to keep up with inflation. But I think the, the issue, as we all know, is that oftentimes it doesn't happen that way, is that whatever COLA adjustments they make on Social Security, it doesn't cover the entire cost of, um, of inflation. And when you look at inflation, I always think of it, even if you look at broad-based, um, the, the things that impact retirees the most are usually health care, food, you know, you know um, housing, that type, those type of issues uh, for, versus sometimes when you look at inflation, we know that TV prices go down, computers go down, but how many TVs do you need if you're retired and how many computers do you need to buy? So the, the core inflation aspects, a lot of times Social Security you know, may not keep up with it. So I think it's important to have supplemental income in addition to Social Security. And this is a conversation that advisors just has to have with their clients to make them aware, to educate them that you know you will have social security but oftentimes it's not going to be enough and even people with pensions many people don't realize that most pensions especially private pensions don't have even if they were lucky to have one which most obviously americans don't have anymore they usually don't have a cola adjustment or even if they have a cola adjustment uh, it could be taken away and i used to read um, the employee benefits manuals when i used to do fee-based planning and even if they have retirement health care a lot of people will have you know maybe they were grandfathered into some kind of retirement health care system, and they don't need Medicare. They don't think they need Medicare. Um, but then if you read the fine print, it will actually say for many companies that they have the uh, option to take the retirement health care away, that, that it's, it's actually a voluntary. They do it when they could provide it. But, um, you know, they have the option to do that if the costs have become prohibitive. So I think it's important to, as, as we talked about, to have that conversation with clients that, 
to let them know that whatever they're thinking is some people are different extremes. Some people, they don't think they're ever going to collect social security. While other people think that social security is going to be the main source of income and just let them know that there's other factors like inflation and things that might affect how their overall economic outlook is without, if they don't do any supplemental retirement planning. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, Initially, and, and I think to this day, I think the, the Social Security was supposed to take care of, I don't, you know, maybe 40% of total you know, retirement income of all the other assets, the other one being, you know, savings, investments, things like this, uh, and, and purchasing any kind of inflation protection outside of Social Security, you know, buying a pri privately issued product, whatever, whatever the product is, whatever the solution is, it's expensive. Right. So it's, it's tough to have something that is automatically adjusted for inflation or accounts for inflation. So we have that built in into Social Security. But as Jake said, says, we got to have some other sources to keep up with inflation, again, being, you know, other source of income or other source of investments and savings and such uh, to really supplement, you know, the, the, the cost of uh, life uh, uh, going up. Mm. Myth number three. I think. I think, let's see, I think what I get a lot on number three is it touches on the full retirement age because it's, it's been very confusing to folks about full, when is the actual full retirement age. Initially, it was 65, and maybe some people are not aware, but it's been, it's been going up since, since then and all the way to age, uh, um, uh, full retirement age to age 67 right now. So initially started at uh, 65 now it's at 67 and and who knows with what's going on with the uh, with the situation whether or not that's not going to go up even higher but it's been systematically increasing so it depends on the year a person a beneficiary was born that's what their full retirement age is going to be and majority of us are still you know 1966 and few months that depends when they were born uh, between 19 40 something to 1959, I believe, uh, 1952 to 1959. It's 66 years and two months, four months, six months, et cetera. And then eventually it's going to, to 67. So that retirement age keeps going up and some folks might not be aware of that. Jen, any uh, additional thoughts on FRA? Yeah, I mean, I think as, as we think about the Social Security Administration, one, one common topic that always comes up is will Social Security be around for X amount of years? Will, you know, will the assets deplete in 2035? And you know, there's so many things that could happen between now and then, obviously. Uh, but full retirement age, as people live longer, that's the key. As people live longer, uh, there's continuous strains on the Social Security system. Uh, they're always being talked about. And full retirement age is one of those variables that they could obviously easily adjust for people who are younger to make it 68 and 69. So it correlates to the potential lifespan that's expected, that's actually expected. Of course. Yeah. So um, I think that's, you know, one thing that they could definitely uh, at some point move up from 67 to 68. There's always debate on that, uh, especially for the younger people who are either, you know, before they, before they're even 20, that it could actually move up to 68 or higher. Yeah. I always think it's important to note like the importance of FRA. That's the age at which you'll get a hundred percent of your primary insurance somehow. Right. That, Correct. Yeah. So people, that's the, that's the, that's the point at which you get, hundred percent of what you're owed. That's, that's correct. Right. Okay. Uh, so myth number five has to do with social security taxes and, and benefits. Right. So I think this one touches on, uh, of, let's say, a beneficiary or a person that paid something to Social Security and whether or not they're going to be eligible for some kind of a benefit. Uh, and the way it really works is, is a person or a beneficiary needs to meet a certain threshold of paying into Social Security in order to enjoy that benefit. So paying taxes to Social Security, yes, it's, it's a good thing. However, uh, the way it's done, uh, the person needs to uh, have or earn uh, 40 working credits. Used to be called quarters, now it's called credits. And I can earn, a person can earn up to four credits per year based on uh, some income levels. It's, and it's not that high. Uh, and the reason why it was a, a, called a quarter, because in the past, you could only earn one every quarter. So if you earn all that money in quarter one, now you get four credits. But before, uh, it was not the case. You had to earn it every single quarter. But now it's not the case. Now it's the credit. So I need to accumulate 
40 of these credits. I earn four of them per year. So I need to have at least 10 years of, of working years and paying into social security. And if I do that, then I'm eligible for some kind of a benefit from uh, a retirement benefit from social security. It's strictly talking about a retirement benefit from social security, not supplemental income or low income or disability, none of that. So, so this is strictly just the retirement benefit from social security. And I will also add to the point, the way it's really calculated is it's, it is based on the 35 uh, years of highest earnings, highest earnings. And they don't have to be consecutive, right? So that's a that's an important thing to keep in mind. So if I am, you know, working now and I had lower earnings, you know, maybe 20 years ago, those high earnings are going to replace, you know, my income, my earnings from let's say 20 years ago. So it's really important for folks to keep good track of all these earning history. Go on Social Security website and look at their own statements. Uh, even though we are paying to Social Security in our own name. But there is no such thing as my account as though it's a bank account. It's, it's a pay-as-you-go system. And if I go online, I, yeah, I see a statement in my name, but I don't have an account with Social Security. But it does have my earnings record history. And it's important to uh, look at that to ensure it's, it's accurate. It's accurate because there is a limited number of time, three years, three months, and 15 days, right? Three, three, and 15. I should write 15 but I have that many years to collect if I find any discrepancies between, you know, what I really earned versus what Social Security has on its record. Okay. And a lot of people don't, uh, you might think that there's some kind of, um, you know, the equation is a direct correlation to, uh, you know, your earnings. For example, some people might think, oh, if I earn $20,000 and then later I earn 100000 my Social Security benefits can be five times as much. It doesn't actually work that way. Uh, so you get percentage-wise more dollar value in the lower incomes. It's a progressive Correct. system. So just because you make five times more doesn't mean that you get five times more benefit. As you, your earnings reach the maximum dollar amount for social security taxation, the benefits you receive become marginally less as you go along. So that's something that a lot of people are unaware of is that there's not a direct one-on-one -on -one dollar increase for every dollar you get taxed on that social security system. So you really want to go into the system and figure out exactly what your benefit will be. And that does increase, um, you know, depending on what the COLA adjustment will be. So, Yeah, that, that, that is a great point, Jake, about, uh, uh, that, that correlation, because there isn't any, I mean, there is a formula that the administration uses couple of, I think they use three different band points. They call them band points percentage wise on income levels. And then they put all that stuff into the formula and then it spits out the actual benefit. But yeah, there is no correlation to, as Jenk mentioned, to uh, lower earnings versus higher earnings later on, later on in life. Mm. You know, I, maybe it's a side note, but when you're talking about the 35 years of earnings history and you look back at what you maybe earned 35 years ago, the good news is that Social Security Administration is doing some wage indexing on that on that former amount, so it, it's uh, being recalculated into, in fact, what near today's dollars, perhaps. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's that's how it's done. It's all adjusted for inflation. So at least maybe uh, you can take heart that what you earned 35 years ago is is not what you'll get for your your benefit, perhaps. Right. <laughs> so what about myth number six, Val? I think you touched on this one a bit earlier, but happy to have you elaborate on it about collecting two benefits uh, as a as a, on your own work record and as a survivor. Yeah, so so that also comes up quite a bit in in a couple of meetings I ha I've had is 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 that question whether or not I'm able to or eligible to collect both, you know, on my on my spouse and then on my own, my ex spouse or DC spouse. And it's really not. So when person files for the benefit, again, the, the administration will look at it as uh, they have, the administration uses this, this term called deemed filing, which basically means the person is eligible for one benefit and whichever of these benefits is the person is eligible for is the highest. That's what they will receive. They are not able to collect, they collect both. So that's a, that's another thing. It's like, well, my mine my own is mine, and then my spouse's was my spouse's. So now I can have both. And unfortunately, it's not the case. Yeah, and sometimes people get confused about the maximum family amount. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one question that comes up a lot. So uh, in my situation, both my spouse and I work, um, and so it, we will. There's no maximum in terms of what we would get individually. The fact and Val could touch upon. 
the, the myth about the maximum family benefit that you could derive. And a lot of times we get that question a lot about two income households and if there's if they're somehow capped because both earners are high wage earners and there might be some limits to how much they receive from Social Security. No. So, the, so there is the, the family maximum really comes into play. It's not between spouses or, you know, ex-spouses or divorced spouses. It really comes in when there are other beneficiaries within within a household. And it's usually could be, you know, a minor child uh, under 16 or up to, uh, I believe it's 19 or until high school, or maybe somebody or, or, or disabled child. Uh, all of them would be eligible for some kind of a benefit. And that's where the, the family maximum comes into a conversation because, because the benefits will be cut to some extent for other benefits, for the minor beneficiaries. And, uh, and there's a formula that the administration does not want exceeded. So that's why there's a fam- family maximum like this. However, there is no, really, again, there's no limit on this for, uh, for, for two spouses, surviving spouse, ex-spouse, uh, 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 current spouse, you know, those, whichever benefit was the highest, that's what the spouse is going to be eligible and there's no limit on that one. Well, I think we could talk for hours about Social Security. I'd uh, love to talk for hours. <laughs> but I think we covered the main things today. I, now. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a benefit that really started uh, 1935 or, or thereabouts, you know, right, right about uh, after the Great Depression. And, you know, it, it withstood a, a test of time and it's taking care of a lot of, you know, families initially just for spouses and, and it became larger and bigger and, and it continues to take care of us as we go through it. So I think, you know, it's, it's somebody had that foresight to do that and it lasted all this, all this time. And I hope, you know, it, it continues to do so and we get to benefit from it. We continue to pay to it and I hope we continue to get to benefit from it down the line. But it is a fascinating, you know, his, from the historical point of view, it's a, it's a fascinating topic of the evolution and, uh, and, and really how does the country and how does really, I guess, the country takes care of, its own citizens. I think it's uh, it's amazing. I'd love to, you know, I'd, I could go on and on and on and on. Well, I'm going to ask you to go on for one more question because you just raised uh, something in my mind that lots of advisors are grappling with, which is the notion that the uh, trust fund will in the next decade or so be exhausted. And at that point, the possibility of paying out benefits 80 cents on the dollar is yeah. at the moment very real. Should planners be thinking about that when they're building plans for their clients, yeah. the possibility of, of reducing the expectation or? I, I think so. You know, if I were to take out my crystal ball, it will tell me exactly what would happen in 10 or 15 years. But, uh, you know, there is that talk. It's uh, And I think, you know, in my humble opinion, there are going to be some changes down the line and, and probably, you know, before 20, let's see, 2033 or so, something's going to happen, whether it's, in, you know, tax base going to go up or the percentages are going to go up or maybe that income, uh, uh, that full retirement age is going to go up. Something's going to happen in there. You know, I was in, I was in on a couple of discussions and conversations, including some lawmakers and consensus. I'm not sure if it's a consensus, but one of the opinions was that if somebody is within five years within retirement or within claiming source security, they can probably count on 100% of the benefit. Or at least that's how they should compute their uh, uh, retirement income planning or asset planning for retirement. If somebody is between five and 10 years of, of retirement or claiming social security, they should probably count on uh, computing 25% less. Mm. And anybody that's over that, then 10 years or more, you know, discount that number from social security, not from any other assets, but from social, by, even by 50%. So I think I think it's going to be a, a, a definitely a, a, you know a topic that's discussed politically. It's 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 critically important to the health of the society and and you know to the elder population. And I think something's going to get done on that one. So you know sooner than later. Mm. Jang, I'll give you the final word on that one. Okay, of course, twenty thirty five is right when I'm about to take social security. So. <laughs> Of course, uh, but I, I think I think I agree with that. There's there's lots of different factors that they uh, they could do some kind of means testing. They could increase the wage base, increase the wage. They could increase the full retirement age. There's so many different variables. Uh, typically, they try not to take away benefits, especially something 
so politically charged as Social Security. They try not to take it away. So I imagine some combination of wage-based increase typically might, you know, just like med Medicare taxes, there's no limit to how much they tax on Medicare uh, taxes on that 1.45% versus Social Security on 62 So there's a lot of variables that they could, they could, they could do with. But I think it's one of those that, um, you know, just from a pragmatic standpoint, that very few politicians uh, like the idea of taking Social Security benefits away from retirees. But I think, as Val mentioned, the closer you are, the more secure that will be. As financial planners, you might well just create a scenario two, you know, a contingent scenario. So scenario one is that you get your full Social Security benefit. Scenario two, you get like 75% or whatever it might be. So as a quick, quick adjustment on your financial planning, just to show clients what the difference might be and how to plan for that accordingly. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm going to guess that for for higher income clients, the impact will be perhaps less because Social Security makes up generally less of their retirement income as a percent. Um, but for lower income, perhaps it's a more dramatic impact. Yes. And, and based on the, the way the, the, the calculations are anyways, I would imagine that if they do make some kind of means testing that people who are in the lower wages will probably not be as affected as much because, you know, Social Security was built as a safety net in the first place. Mm. Well, gentlemen, this has been a great conversation. Uh, any last words before we wrap up? Not, not for me. I enjoyed the um, interaction and, and the Q&A was well done. And I hope it was something that you expected and look forward to uh, coming back sometime soon. Yeah, we really appreciate all the listeners' time, your time. I think it's an important subject. And I think we will continue to monitor it and uh, you know, give you updates as we go along. If there's obviously any legislation passed, I think that advisors at least should be aware of because it will impact most, if not all, of their clients. Well, Val Jeng, thank you ever so much for being on the Exceptional Advisor podcast. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for listening to the Exceptional Advisor podcast brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, and exclusive membership deals, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org.